CalEd's podcast series shares information to help economic development professionals and communities of all sizes build resilient, sustainable economies through effective economic development policies and initiatives. Welcome to today's CalEd podcast. My name is Michelle Stevens, and I am the program director for CalEd. Today, we are discussing community culture and building trust in relation to economic resiliency and disruption. And we are joined by Heidi Pickman from Cameo and Erin Wilcher, an economic development and workforce development consultant. Hi, Heidi. Hi, Michelle. Well, thanks for joining us today. You both served an important role in development of Caled's economic recovery and resiliency playbook. And we want to discuss a foundational part of recovery and resiliency, which is inclusive economic development and trust building. So this podcast series is about economic development, recovery and resiliency in the face of economic disruptions. How would you say community culture fits into that conversation and the planning process for local governments? That's a big question, Michelle. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, A little bit about where my, my perspective comes from is that we are a statewide organization of entrepreneurial training programs, micro micro lenders, all mission driven to serve uh, socially and economically disadvantaged individuals Um, and um, entrepreneurs to start their own businesses, create their own jobs, uh, et cetera. And, what I what we think of when we think of inclusive, we think of it in a couple of ways. We think of one, we absolutely think that small business and very small business development needs to be a part of the economic resiliency toolbox because uh, a, if a lot of the jobs that have been created over the past couple of years since COVID have been um, because people have started their own businesses. There's been record numbers of business st- applications, business start applications, um, a huge level level shift. It was pre-pandemic about 3.5 million. This is nationwide. Um, and now it's about 5 million. So there's this huge increase in entrepreneurial activity and people creating it, their own jobs. And the people that are doing it are people of color and, and women. Um, so I'll let, I'll let Aaron d- dive in. And uh... Yeah, I mean, so just by way of introduction, um, you know, I'm coming at this thinking about a couple different activities. One, Michelle, you mentioned the um, my participation in the Recovery and Resiliency Playbook for CalEd and um, uh, authoring the Community Culture chapter. And so the work that I did in creating the case studies there, um, going back into the literature, talking to my colleagues um, about this subject, And also uh, a project I conducted with a colleague a few years ago where we interviewed 30 community and economic development leaders in the Sierra uh, region and rural Northern California about the opportunity of outdoor recreation as a community development strategy and asking them lots of questions around the goals and uh, vision of their communities and how economic development kind of fits into that. And so one thing I just want to start off with is just I was thinking about what is it we're talking about when we're talking about community culture and economic community economic development. And, you know, the thing that really struck me um, going back to the uh, the playbook and that previous project I mentioned was just how I think what we're talking a lot about here is. Um, building trusting relationships that are grounded in the fabric of a community, uh, things that we might consider to be intangible, that when we have disruptions in our economy or um, we're trying to get grant dollars out the door, do planning are really critical in terms of um, this foundation about the kind of relationships and the democratic systems we have in our communities. So, I mean, I 
think about, you know, what we might describe as the fabric of the community, the historical relationships about our economic specializations and the kind of businesses we have, um, the history of our achievements and the prosperity in our businesses and our, our economies. Um, but like, how does all that relate to um, how we participate in planning processes and engage around sort of program initiation. I mean, how are we getting together and what basis do we have for the kind of trusting relationships that we have to be able to do that type of work? Um, you know, I, I, I guess I think of this about, is like a lot about creating some sort of shared identity amid diversity, right? Like how do we, sort of all think about our communities in terms of pride in uh, civic pride, the kinds of things we tell family and friends coming in from out of town about what makes this place special and, um, you know, what binds us together. I mean, we, we have all are going to have different ways that we describe that, but like, what are the common things that emerge as we, as we talk about our community? So, um, you know, really, it's like about how do we consider our communities in ways that like anchor ourselves in um, what 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 makes us special? How do we enhance that and tell other people about it as we're doing our planning? So sort of hard to describe community culture, but it's so important in terms of how we do um, our planning and, and program development and how we're able to kind of respond to shocks, right? Yeah. I wanna yeah. add, can I add something, Michelle? Oh, of course. Sure. Um, I think if you're talking about inclusive economic development though, there's two things with inclusive, right? There's representation and you really have to engage all the stakeholders and the community and the trusted partners that are on the ground, um, as well as give them a voice, not just have them at the table, but listen and have these, and it, it sounds like a relationship 101, um, but it, people are, have, uh, you know, uh, communities of color have not been included necessarily in planning processes and don't necessarily have that trust. And it's using those trusted partners um, that are on the ground, that are working with these communities that you could build trust with um, and bringing them to the table. Uh, for example, um, PPP loans, right? When we were trying to get the payroll protection program loans out, those forgivable loans for small businesses, the black community doesn't have a great relationship with the banking community. So in order to get people of black business owners, PPP loans, they got them through their trusted partners on the ground, not from their banks, mm -hmm. um, but from trusted community-based partners on the ground. So it's really important to have, um, you know, a wide variety of stakeholders. I think the SURF um, Community Economic Resiliency Fund, the, the $600 million <laughs> um, every, that everybody knows about in California, the $600 million grant fund, um, is really, I think, doing a good job of trying to bring in all sorts of stakeholders from all different um, players in each region to kind of open that up. So and open open it up for real rep representation. In, there's inclusivity, and then there's take it one step forward. There's the equity, which is the li more the listening piece and giving people um, a de decision making role. Yeah, I mean, you guys just um, dropped so many. <laughs> that, that was such a dense section of conversation. There's so many things that I want to pull out of it. Um, I'm trying to think of just like the highlights. I love how you mentioned Heidi, not just um, bringing someone to the table, but truly listening to them. I mean, I think that speaks to, you know, doing more than the lip service. Don't say, oh, yes, we're very inclusive. Look, we invited all these people. And then we um, quickly moved them out of the photo op and did what we were always going to do <laughs> type of thing. Um, so the listening component, that relationship 101, I really appreciate also what Aaron said about the building trust. I mean, I'm a strong believer that you can't 
be a successful economic developer if you don't have a trusting relationship with the businesses and overall your general community. They need to know that, you know, you're looking out for their best interest and and that you've got their back. Um, so that was just a great kickoff. <laughs> so um, one of the things Aaron mentioned was the, the discussion of intangibles. So if we're thinking about community culture, what are some of those intangibles? that Because maybe like right now we just jumped right in it full force, but maybe some of our listeners are thinking like, what are they talking about? So like, what are some intangibles that folks should have in mind when they're thinking about their community culture? You know, I have to admit when I, this word, I, I struggled with it a little bit uh, in, in, in prepping here. I mean, I, I think in some ways the intangibles we, we started to unpack when we're talking about um, these things that are kind of hard to define. And, and Michelle, just to be perfectly candid, I mean, in the development of the community culture chapter that I worked on for the playbook, I think we spent a lot of time just trying talking through and around what, what the heck is this thing. And so it is kind of hard to put your finger on it. Um, and some of the phrases and words that I used were ways that we attempted to try to kind of make the intangible tangible by talking about, um, you know, words like uh, community fabric, um, historical, uh, uh, you know, cultural initiatives, um, uh, you know, I civic pride and identity. So these things that are kind of big concepts that ultimately are the kinds of things that I think are um, the things, the the glue that sort of holds us together, the kinds of things that we're 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 proud of. Again, that we would tell family and friends visiting from out of state about, um, and the the ways we would kind of talk about our communities when people ask us when where where we're from when we go um, uh, out of town. But ultimately, we know, I mean, as economic development people that like what these are the kinds of things that um, make us special and unique that will attract other people to our communities that, um, you know, uh, equate to vibrancy and innovation um, when we're getting together and kind of um, able to do the things that make us unique and special. I do think there's ways, though, that we, you know, we've got to have like tangible outcomes from these intangibles. Um, I think partly by enabling people who are better than us who are into public policy and economics at like um, moving forward, cultural expression, identity, and those kinds of things that lead to vibrancy and innovation. Um, one of the things that I wrote about in the community culture chapter um, was the history a little bit of the history of kind of the emergence of um, the offices of cultural affairs and those uh, programs that support uh, cultural initiatives. Um, there were, you know, this kind of followed on like Richard Florida by now is kind of a household name. And um, there were people like Ann Markison and Ann Godwa who were uh, supporting community engagement initiatives around the country. Uh, notably in San Jose, there was a case study I did there about their Office of Cultural Affairs and development of like creative placemaking initiatives. I mean, it's the it's the people who I think um, both in the arts and humanities, but also just kind of like in community organizing and neighborhoods that are the ones who are going to really be able to answer the questions about who we are, what we're good at. Um, I mean, we can do that too by doing economic analysis of like, um, you know, where we've got good location quotients and stuff like that. But um, I do think it's a combination of um, the people on the ground, our residents, our small businesses, and um, those of us who are working at like the policy and community scale and stakeholder level to try to figure out um, these questions. Who are we? What binds us together? What are we good at? Yeah. Um, Aaron, I'm glad you mentioned economics because I was I'm an ABD in economics. Didn't finish my PhD, but got a did a, did a lot of classes. And uh, when you talk about intangibles from a business sense, a lot of times what they're talking about is reputation, 
right? And and measuring. So you take out all the other effects, you know, the profit and loss, the human capital, and then you've got this little plus epsilon over there that talks about the reputational effects. Um, and that's what exactly what you're getting at, Aaron, is like a quality of life index or the dynamism. And you can, you know, you can measure that in, in actual quantifiable ways. There are ways to get at that. So you can measure intangibles. But one of the things that we talk about when we talk about the business, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is culture. And we, we don't need, mean culture in the sense of ballet and painting and the <laughs> performing arts, but the culture of entrepreneurship and how, I mean, there's all sorts of cultures, right? There's the outdoor culture. Are we, are we walkable cafe culture? You know, it's all, there's whatever your um, community um, kind of adapts. But for us, the entrepreneurial culture, and this is always, we struggle with it too on how to define it but one of the ways um, a couple of things we say um, are uh, you know how how are entrepreneurs looked at in your community is it a good thing like is it a good thing that you want to become an entrepreneur if you know uh, is it a good thing does the community support local small businesses, um, that kind of, that kind of things. Is there a shop local program? I know here in Oakland, we have a lot of cities around the country have a, have a shop local and a lot of it's marketing and a lot of it's, um, uh, PR, but it's not necessarily, you know, that's all, uh, getting into, you know, what you call into the fabric, right? Why you like living in a place. So I think, um, you know, you could have a culture that's the mall culture. There was once a, in the 80s, right? <laughs> a lot of movies made about that. Um, so, it, you know, what kind of culture, I think, you know, the intangibles in the culture is uh, is kind of something um, that, you can measure, and it's also poli public policy. Do you want to invite them all, or do you want to invite a vibrant, um, local, unique uh, set of businesses to that reflect your that reflect more your community? Can I, think can, can I just say one thing here? Yeah. Um, in in response is, um, you know, I think there's a way in which one of the things we uncovered in our interview project I mentioned that we did where we interviewed 30 uh, community and economic development leaders. A lot of these folks were talking about something else entirely, which is kind of like um, creating a place for your existing residents and businesses to grow um, based on their priorities and the, and how, like how we're going to engage them. So um, I think in a way, it's, it's, it's sort of a counterintuitive way, again, to the way we traditionally think about economic development being like an um, external facing uh, sales outfit for, uh, you know, bringing in businesses from outside. I love what you're saying, Aaron, because that's exactly what we've been trying to trying to the mind shift we've been trying to make is develop your local economy, and see what your assets are in in your local economy, and build on those. And you know, I, I love the study you did with the outdoor recreation. I mean, you go to any of the mountain communities in um, the, the the foothill communities in um, North mid like near Sacramento it's gold rush it yeah the Sierra yeah gold rush it there's this vibrant communities are based around wine and outdoor activity like all of it combined and just taking the good rich kind of assets that their community has and taking it and creating successful businesses from within not not from without and making it a desirable place for people to people to come and um, hang out, spend money, live also. I mean, yeah, I think um, it's interesting because I mean, Cal Ed, we've been saying this for years that economic development is not a one size fits all proposition. It's like you do need, you can't just take any plan and say, okay, I'll insert this and, and wait for the success to just roll in. Uh, you really do need to look at what does your community do well? What is your culture? I like how both of you described it, the both the reputation as well as if you have 
guests from out of town, what do you tell them about your community? Those are like really easy back of the napkin ways to think about culture and how you describe it. We kind of already got into how those intangibles that we're talking about shape economic development and the efforts of economic developers. Would you guys, um, how would you say that community culture can hinder recovery and resiliency? And I immediately think of the example you gave, um, Heidi, about how black businesses don't necessarily have a good relationship with the banking community and how if it stopped there, that could be a real hindrance to recovery. But it sounds like you were able to get past that to some extent with the people. In some cases, right? I mean, yeah. uh, um, to be, to be honest that the, you know, the, the CDFIs, the community development financial institutions um, did what they could to reach out to their communities, which is um, a lot of them. And a lot of them are focused on, on business owners of color because they're not being served by traditional, by traditional methods. Um, So I think, and also the Latino, the Latino community, the Latino community doesn't necessarily trust government. They'll trust They'll trust their neighbor who works for a, a nonprofit or something like that that says, hey, this is a good program. Like, this is a good program. Don't worry. I'll help you through it and um, and and get you what you need for resiliency. I think um, the, a lot of the hindrance we found, um, b- believe it or not, in some of the business owners, they're not connected um, especially in older, the older generation, I would say of, of immigrant business owners um, weren't necessarily connected to email. <laughs> didn't have email, so they didn't know about the program. So people were going door to door. That's and that's like literally people were going to door to door. Have you heard about the California grant program? They ha- they didn't know how to scan documents. They didn't know what a PDF was. This stuff is all common knowledge to us, but in their day to day business, uh, whatever, of running a bodega or running, um, you know, a small shop in an in a ethnic neighborhood or a restaurant or something like that, they didn't need to ha- know what a PDF was or, or whatever. They, they do now and they're getting there, you know, so there's, I think, a couple um, of, of lessons we learned, so kind of to flip it on its head to have a solution is more definitely, and we're good at we're good at this in California for the most part, but not you know we need to do better. Um, yeah. Is in language and cultural relevant um, information about um, about what we're offering. Um, uh, the um, you know, like I do know the California Relief Grant where um, that was there were webinars in 20 languages or something like that. Not every language, but, you know, a lot. We had a lot of community partners on the ground, but literally knocking on doors and saying, hey, I can help you apply for this. Um, I would say the other way, this isn't necessarily community culture, but, you know, with opportunity brings a lot of fraudsters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, and, and there's, so there's, it just highlights the importance of that trusted partner on the ground um, and the, and, and, and to engage those folks because they were able to say, no, 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 this is the, you know, that one is not quite the website. This is the way, you know, this is the website and this is the one to go to because I trust you. I'm going to apply. Yeah, no, that's a perfect seg into the next question, which I think it's important because we're talking about culture and trust is interwoven in that. So for someone who is a new economic developer, what steps can he or she take to build trust with their business community? And like, um, if each of you could just throw out a couple that folks can put in their back pocket and remember whether they're starting in a new community or they are in an existing community and maybe don't have the best trust with their businesses yet. Yeah. I mean, I I think um, there's, there's kind of, I'm glad we're getting to the solutions part of things. (laughs) And, you know, one of the things I think will be kind of an ongoing learning process and I'd be interested to kind of hear what, um, 
uh, the Cal Ed community thinks, if there might be sort of trainings developed around this. Uh, and here we go back to the intangible. I mean, I think a lot of what enables us to build these trusting relationships and community connections is, is stuff that is not necessarily like in our work plan or our project management plans. And a lot of it's like, how do you get out of the office and, and on the ground to connect with, um, with people who are these connectors? Um, I'll refer back to our, um, our interview project again, when we, uh, throughout our interviews, uh, um, identified people that we ended up calling community catalysts. Um, another way to think of this was in the book, uh, the Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, Tipping Point, I think it was, where he talks about um, the maven figure, uh, the idea of these super connected people who can be both your best allies or sometimes your worst enemies, but that's okay. As long as you're engaged, you want that kind of um, critique and feedback, but these people who we all know them, uh, they might be in our families, they might be our neighbors, they might be a small business owner. And it's like the person on your block or around the corner who knows way more people in the neighborhood than the president of the neighborhood association, or, you know, like the, you know, the, the, the parish priest or, you know, the, um, uh, your local kind of uh, spiritual advisor, whoever it might be, these people who can uh, totally know what's going on in the community, they can broadcast your efforts, um, they can know who can be those people who informally can knock on doors, um, or who, who you might be able to recruit to attend um, a church gathering or a farmer's market or whatever it is to um, get the word out about whatever sort of program or initiative you're trying to get to. Um, so I think, you know, that's for a new economic developer, I think that's the, the, the key is we can be overwhelmed with the kind of mechanical aspects of reporting or generating new funding or whatever, but it's, you know, how do you get out of the office, uh, one day every other week to go and meet, uh, people in the community, by the way, uh, many of whom might not be charismatic or have um, traditional sort of um, educational backgrounds or look like us, but to be open to those ideas about who those connector people are, uh, some of whom are known, and then others we might need to identify ourselves um, as leaders and to kind of like help them kind of come up, right? And that's more on the DEI end where I think, um, we also need to help new and emerging leaders to kind of come up who might have talents that um, are and are not traditional in nature. Um, yeah, Aaron, you put you hit on a good thing. The thing that struck me is the relationship building piece is not the easy piece, right? That's the time consuming. It takes time to build trust and it takes time to say, hey, I'm here to help you and then for you to believe that I'm going to help you. Right. So that it's, it's what in, in the, in the business world, like in the, in the uh, micro business sector in our entrepreneurial ecosystem, it's the coaching. It's that, it's that long relationship handholding type of thing. And it's, it just doesn't come by just showing up once or twice. Right. And it's, it comes over a, a long time. So, um, I, I, but yes, you absolutely have to have to get out and meet the people and can't sit behind the desk. Um, and do that a couple other people to meet. I'm glad you mentioned farmers markets because that's where a lot of, a lot of micro businesses start, right? They start at the, you start at the farmers market or a food truck. Um, or a, they go from a farmers market booth to a food truck, right? And then maybe to a brick and mortar or maybe, to developing value-added products and selling them to Whole Foods or something like that. There's all sorts of ways a business can grow. But the other, some of the other people who are connected to those businesses are if um, your community has a women's business center or a small business development center or a lot of EDCs, economic development 
corporations, corporations and <laughs> CDCs, all the all the acronyms. There's there's lots of nonprofits um, that are working with small businesses that are connected to the communities, and they're they are cre- helping to create successful businesses. And and really, know, these people really, really, really know their communities. So yeah. it's really um, it's a, they're good people to know. Um, another a good organization is if your community has a community development financial institution, um, which is a, a nonprofit lender. But not all non, not not all CDFIs are nonprofit, but they're all mission driven to serve um, to serve in the interest of business in, in the business owner. Yeah, those are great great tips. I think. Um, a, a lot of folks think that economic developers have to be out there. And I think you're under underlining that statement. It helps to be a social gadfly. If you're going to be an economic development, get out of your office, talk to people, talk to, you know, go beyond just like the business leaders, but also the community leaders. How does marginalization and exclusion hamper economic resiliency and recovery? Like what, for those who aren't convinced (laughs) that everyone in your community needs to be involved, what I I have my back of the envelope calculation for that, Michelle, which anybody, anybody who's interested in numbers, if we brought um, uh, business owners of color, women business owners in parity with their white counterparts, We'd increase the national GDP by about, uh, I think it's $10 trillion. This is a back of the envelope calculation, but that you can see the scale. Our GDP, that's about 46% increase in the GDP. Doing that would make more economic activity activity for everyone Mm -hmm. and more economic prosperity. And, you know, then not to say... When you have, when you're not, um, when when people are more equal and have this opportunity, you're not, you're saving money on all sorts of, all sorts of things, right? Yeah. Um, subsidies and things like that. So, for me, it's an easy answer. That's the that's the easy answer. It's economic. It's more economic prosperity for everyone. Yeah, that makes sense. Aaron, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, just, I mean, a, a, a couple thoughts here. There were a few things I wrote down uh, preparing for this. I mean, uh, the f- one thing is just, you know, I'm, I'm involved in the Sacramento area um, in workforce and economic development initiatives. As we were developing our most recent SEDS uh, through our most recent SEDS process, um, and what resulted was called the prosperity strategy. You know, this is the five-year SEDS planning. And um, through that process, I think we had technical support from uh, representatives from Brookings Institution who, um, you know, cited a lot of their literature and research suggesting that, look, if you are not an inclusive uh, metro area, you are uh, significantly less competitive. I mean, the, there's Brookings has written about this and through their, you know, Metropolitan Policy Program done that comparative analysis. Um, and, you know, we could probably find the reports and, and, and share that with the audience. So, I, I mean, there's a real dollars and cents in terms of like Michael Porter and global competition. If, if you're not bringing in um, uh, all parts of your community and giving them supports um, and seeing them thrive, then um, you're going to kind of lose out in the global marketplace. As we were kind of winding things up. So I wanted to leave folks with a few tips that they can incorporate. So first one, we're talking about reaching out to people who aren't necessarily always at the table. So what is your advice to economic developers who are trying to engage with people who don't have the time to be a part of the public process or are not really interested in being a part of the public process, how do you how do you get in, get them involved? I think we've kind of talked about that in in several. It's 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 connecting with 
those communities leaders is connecting with those community the organizations that are the trusted partners on the ground and forming really good relationship with with them and and meeting people where they are you mm-hmm. know um going to the churches to meet with um, the African-American community, going to whatever the institution or the trusted partner is for your community, going to that and going to them and and saying, hey, we're here and this is what we want to do. I think it's meeting, a lot of it's meeting people where they are and not expecting them to come to you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so I, I sort of wrote down three three words here. The the first one is uh, mavens, right? Our our community catalysts. Uh, the second one is um, intentionality, and by that I mean, well, and I'll get to the third word, which is um, like training and policy. So. You know, I think we, we've talked some about, we know, many of us know who these uh, community leaders are. We can all stand to meet uh, more, more of these folks and learn from their, you know, connections, their wisdom, their, their history and their neighborhoods. Um, but the question is, how do we actually create organizational structures that allow us the time to be able to do that? Uh, not just allow us the time, but actually like mandate, if you want to use that word, that we're out there kind of making these connections uh, in our communities and that we're accountable for, um, you know, being in touch with them on a regular basis. And, you know, I think that really gets done through uh, training and policy. Like we have to have organizational structures that encourage us to do this. And we have to have kind of the ability to be able to do it. Um, these are things that I could, could stand to have in my own organization um, and for myself. And so maybe, you know, Michelle, uh, for us, like through Khaled, um, with other partners, we could talk about what that might look like moving forward. Um, but, you know, I think it really gets to like, you know, be able, being able to have uncomfortable conversations as organizations and as professionals, like what would it take for us to have, you know, have better understanding and better conversations with people who, again, you know, don't have our professional training and background, come from totally different places. Maybe they're immigrants from another country. Maybe they're in rural communities uh, and have, you know, have been, um, ranchers, maybe whatever the background is, just how do we kind of continue to be able to understand the experience of other people in ways that allow them to kind of like come in to the fold and participate in the process. Um, and ultimately like this is recovery and resiliency, right? Like these are folks who need to participate into being able to get the benefits from public dollars. And we have initiatives and like emergency funds, like what Heidi was talking about. Yeah, I would I would add that just to caution is not though when, when you're talking organizational structures to impose some kind of organizational structure that's your organizational structure on someone else on someone else's culture right like if it's in their in their community and let them you know there's I know that we have to work within the system right but um, is to really um, you know say hey here are the parameters and you, you do you know giving giving enough enough leeway and flexibility um, that, that those community, you know, meet the community again, meet the community where they are and not being, not, not where you are and, and expect them to, to do things the way you would do them, you know, and have more of an outcomes based kind of measurement where, Hey, we want you guys to be successful. This is where you need to be. You know, unfortunately, for example, you know, within the system, unfortunately, you need to have bank statements and tax returns, right, to get some of these state grants, all right, but, like, how can we make it, how can, how can we make it the organizational structure is responsive to the community and not necessarily what we, what you or I would impose on them? Yeah, no, those are great, great takeaways for our listeners, and that, which brings me to our last um, takeaway we're talking about the um, the playbook 
And all of this info, or almost all of it, I feel like we've tapped into some new info in this conversation, Um, but most of it is in our playbook. So how would you guys um, recommend using the playbook for economic developers? Aaron, I'll let you go. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great, I mean, Michelle, I want to say um, thank you for putting this together um, uh, to you and, and Gerbax. And um, uh, this kind of discussion, I think, is something I would I would welcome more of. In other words, uh, you know, the, the cal has got um, the rural exchange I've participated in. I think being able to kind of com- continue to communicate the findings of this and to share the findings with um, you know, our colleagues and our, our stakeholders is a, is a welcome thing. And, you know, so I just would invite people to, um, you know, use, use the playbook, um, reference it and to continue asking questions. I mean, I think the case studies that are, that are there are, um, invaluable and, you know, I'm certainly going to continue to go back to the playbook and look for, um, references both, you know, as I'm uh, doing my own sort of like grant applications and proposal development and kind of thinking through the creation of initiatives and programs and the kinds of things that we need to sort of lay out for um, how we're doing our, our community engagement, how we're doing our planning. And and um, so it's a, it's a great resource. I think we'll, we'll keep going back to. Right. Yeah. Hi. Well, I just want to um, say I'm super flattered that um, you included me in this conversation with economic development professionals because that's not my background and that's not my training. And um, but my background is small business development and recognizing that that's a key part of the economic development toolkit. Um, I know we've been trying to talk about this and I think I I actually think the pandemic gave us. made people understand how important small businesses are to their communities and what's happening in in downtowns and the lack of small businesses and what that's doing to their streets. I think with the playbook, uh, there's so it, it is so rich and it it should be used as a resource. Exactly what Aaron said, and to not get overwhelmed is maybe take one or two pieces from it that resonate with you, uh, and. Read really read the case studies. See how things uh, the ideas in that playbook um, are adaptable to your community. Don't try and do like everything all at once, so you don't get overwhelmed and then just throw up your hands. So I mean, I think that one of the most important pieces in in the playbook is get to know who are the players and make sure make sure there's open lines of communication because when disaster hits and we're talking about fires and we're talking about pandemics we're talking about all of it you know who who needs to be at the table and where they fit and and who they can reach out to so i think that's central because if everybody's working in their little silos that's not where resiliency and and resilient and sustainability and thrive and that's not where it's going to be it's not going to be where everybody's staying in their silos it's going to be knowing knowing the field yeah definitely well i think I think it's a good note to end on. We're talking about recovery and resiliency. If you are truly going to be a resilient community, you need to have your entire community at the table. Um, Communities that turn their back on one corner of the the city and just pretend it's not there, that's not going to help your recovery. That's not going to help you get back on your feet after a disaster or um, an economic disturbance. So I... Thank you so much to both of you. I'm, I really appreciate both the effort that you guys gave and the expertise that you gave to the playbook writing process. And then also, once again, giving your time for this podcast. Thank you so much. It was my honor. Thanks. Thanks. Good to chat with you, Aaron. Yeah, same. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Michelle. Mm-hmm.